the son of Ken Griffey is the most beloved baseball player of the last 50 years. Fans were worried that they wouldn't ever get to see a player make it into the Hall of Fame with a Mariner's hat on his plaque. Not because Junior wouldn't get in, everyone saw that coming 20 years before the fact, but because it was rumored that his plaque would be sculpted with his hat on backwards. He'd always worn it like that, not as any kind of statement, but because he was always wearing his dad's Reds hat as a little kid and it kept falling in his face unless he turned it around. The public image of Junior was one of a guy who, on top of being astounding at baseball, had more fun than anyone. Always laughing, starring in funny commercials, pulling increasingly ingenious and elaborate pranks on his teammates. The story of the real Ken Griffey Jr. was incompatible with what we saw. The Mariners made Junior 1987's number one overall draft pick, signing him right out of high school. He became a celebrity very quickly tearing through the minors and receiving a spring training invite with big leaguers in 1989. He played so well that manager Jim Lefebvre had no choice but to start him at center field on opening day. He's shown us he can do everything, Lefebvre said. There isn't one thing he can't do. Others agreed. In their 1989 set, the brand new Upper Deck Baseball Card Company reserved their number one slot, traditionally reserved for a superstar, for a 19-year-old who had yet to appear in a single Major League Baseball game. He didn't let him down. Wins above replacement is a metric that attempts to estimate a player's overall value to his team in terms of wins. Junior's mark in 89 was just over three, the best baseball had seen from a teenage position player in over 60 years. His season could have been even better had he not missed a month of action after slipping and falling in the shower. Junior was already becoming the first great Seattle Mariner. The first era, the era of forgotten bums piecing together losing season after losing season in a far-flung corner of the country, was over, and Junior ended it. Most have no idea of what he went through. At age 17, he was shipped off from a Cincinnati home to play minor league ball in Bellingham, Washington. He literally could not have been sent any further from home. Ken Sr., a three-time All-Star, knew what it was to be a baseball star, but his son's journey was something else entirely. Junior was saddled with massive expectations before his 18th birthday. The pressure, coupled with the loneliness of being so far from home, weighed on him enormously. He struggled with depression, and years later he would disclose that he once made an attempt on his own life in this time. But that time, and every time, Senior was there, helping him navigate an experience that no one can truly be ready for. What was once a combative relationship between the two faded as Senior came to recognize the burden his son was carrying. Sometimes, he said, the only privacy he gets is out in center field. Here's Junior during a game in 1990, chasing down an outfield fly. His dad is in the building, looking on. When Junior pulls a classic Junior move and steals the catch from the left fielder, all Senior can do is laugh. There he is. The 40-year-old Griffey was teammates with his 20-year-old son. Not only that, the two were neighbors in the outfield and batted right next to each other in the lineup. In one of baseball's best-known pieces of trivia, they became the first father-son duo to hit back-to-back -back home runs. Sure, acquiring senior in the first place was probably a publicity stunt, but you're going to hear these words from me quite often. Who cares? In 92, thanks to unreliable pitching, they followed up their first ever winning season by dipping far into the red, seemingly undoing years of positive momentum. They had now finished dead last in the standings for the sixth time in their 16 year history. For reasons we'll eventually get into, this wasn't such a bad thing. Meet Jay Buhner. In one of the great heists of the 1980s, the Mariners had fleeced the dreaded Yankees out of the power hitting right fielder, giving up only Greg Phelps in return. Okay, so here's my chance to solve a decades-old mystery for people who watched Steinfeld but didn't watch baseball. Remember the episode where Frank Costanza starts yelling at George Steinbrenner out of nowhere about some guy named Jay Buhner? What the hell did you trade Jay Buhner for? <laughs> you don't know what the hell you're doing! <laughs> and Steinbrenner goes on instead about some guy named Ken Phelps. My baseball people love Ken Phelps' bat. They kept saying, Ken Phelps, Ken Phelps. Well, this is what Frank was so mad about. <laughs> Unlike Griffey, Buhner is not a five-tool player. He doesn't steal bases, hit for average, or field all that well. He is, however, a master practitioner of blurping. 
Blurping is a term Buner himself came up with, and it refers to the act of vomiting on cue for the purpose of eliciting pukes from nearby sympathy vomiters. Why? These are the Seattle Mariners. We'll never be able to answer why questions. When, what, who? Sure, we can help you with those questions. But not why. Buner demonstrated his true mastery of the craft during a game in 1992. In right field, Buner executed a blurp, spilling his lunch on the turf. It must have been a remarkable performance because when left fielder Kevin Mitchell watched from about 200 feet away, he became queasy and began puking as well. Finally, Grivy Jr. looked over from center field. He couldn't hold it in and began to vomit. The entire Seattle Mariners outfield was vomiting at the same time. Jay Buhner had just executed the triple blurp in the middle of a baseball game. By the time 1993 rolled around, Griffey's game reached new heights, and at age 23 was making history to be as great as he was, as young as he was. On July 25th, after homering in each of the previous five nights, this shot off Jose Mesa made him the youngest player to ever go deep in six consecutive games. Then he did it again in the game after that. Then he did it again in the game after that. First pitch from Baxter's walk away. There it goes! See you later! Upper deck! Griffey has tied the Major League record! Holy cow, the kid has done it! Tying the all-time record at eight straight that to this day has only been done by two other players regardless of age. When the dust settled on that season, he'd topped a batting average of 300 to go along with 45 homers. It all led to the most total bases by a 23-year-old since Hank Aaron back in 1957. At that point, Griffey's career totals included 132 homers, 1,428 total bases, and 453 RBI. That was the most career dingers anyone his age had hit since Frank Robinson. Only Mel Ott, over 60 years prior, had accumulated that many total bases, while a player so young hadn't driven in over 450 runs since Ted Williams prior to departing MLB to fight in World War II. Combined with his fourth straight gold glove, if it wasn't clear before, 1993 removed any and all doubt that we were witnessing a once-in-a-generation talent blossoming before our very eyes. Just like the 1981 season, 1994 was shortened by a labor dispute. And just like 81, 94 was monumentally weird for the Mariners. One of the most sought after records was the single season home run mark of 61, set by Roger Maris in 1961. In the three plus decades to follow, only three guys, 1965 Willie Mays, 1977 George Foster, and 1990 Cecil Fielder, came within even 10 of that number, and those guys lost pace with them before the season was even half over. But in 1994, Griffey, who we see here in green, helped to lead an armada of players in pursuit of Maris and his record. Matt Williams, Jeff Bagwell, Frank Thomas, Barry Bonds, and Albert Bell were bum-rushing the history books. But it felt like Junior, who of course was capable of going on home run tears without warning, had the best shot. The strike wiped out the season in August, and ever since we've been left to wonder what would have happened. I'm left in a state of personal conflict here. On one hand, collective action is good and labor strikes are cool. On the other hand, I was looking forward to seeing where the squiggly lines were going to go on my computer screen. The strike also denied us a chance to witness some history that was headed in the opposite direction. Over the years, there had been seven teams in the AL West. With that much competition, the Mariners had no chance of contending. But in 94, the American League was realigned. They were now only four teams. And as luck would have it, all four were garbage. The strike mercifully abbreviated what probably would have ended up as the worst division in baseball history. At the end of it, the Rangers were leading the West with a 52-62 and 62 record. The Mariners, despite being as bad as ever, were only a couple games out. It was the closest they'd ever come to first at the end of a season. And if everyone else getting worse is what it took to get the Mariners into contention, so be it. Forget their win-loss record though. Who cares? The Seattle Mariners seemed like the team of the future. They were wearing new uniforms now, with a redesigned logo and an electric blue jersey. In a time when domes were still cool, they played in the Kingdome, which sat in the shadow of the Cascades. 
and in the middle of a mysterious distant city whose cultural exports were computer stuff and Nirvana and the Space Needle. Around this time, I was growing up in places I found ordinary because you always think the place you live in is ordinary. It was easy to assign a mystique to this faraway, futuristic paradise and the superhero who lived there. After some early 90s rumblings of a potential move to Florida, the anxiety of keeping baseball in Seattle had vanished as well. In a turn of events that sounds made up by an eight-year-old, a majority stake in the Mariners was bought by Hiroshi Yamauchi, the president of Nintendo. Yamauchi was a billionaire who had never been to a baseball game, didn't know who Ken Griffey Jr. was, and seemed to be more interested in expanding Nintendo of America's footprint than actually turning a profit. He wasn't prepared for how happy the Mariners actually made people. As he put it, it was as though the money he spent was alive. Throughout its history, Seattle baseball was regularly in trouble, and its only victory was in simply being allowed to exist. Now they had real identity. They had their superstar. They were the coolest team in baseball. Somehow, things had come together. It was the perfect time for things to fall apart. While the team was warming up on July 19th, four of the Kingdom's ceiling tiles fell and collapsed into the seats. Nobody was hurt, but Mariners games were immediately relocated to other venues, and the players' strike ensured that there would be no more Mariners home games throughout the rest of the season. The team's ownership group leveraged this to demand public money for a new stadium to replace the Kingdom, which wasn't yet 20 years old. If they didn't get this funding, they would sell the team, likely to someone who would move them out of town. There was no way no way this was happening again. Not now. Not the minute Seattle baseball finally found relevance after all these decades. It wasn't fair. In a different, more normal world, a baseball team would build a baseball stadium and play there and that would be that. It's as though Seattle baseball has to perpetually fight simply to exist. As though it's running afoul of the order of the universe. It's determined that a special election will be held in September of 1995. The public will, in effect, decide whether an increase in sales tax is worth keeping the Seattle Mariners, the Mariners themselves, who have never reached the playoffs or even finished better than third in their division, have no choice but to convince the public by making their case on the field. They'll be led by Lou Pinella, now three years into his decade-long career as the Mariners' manager, and beloved by players and fans alike. Pinella had been Ken Griffey Sr.'s teammate in New York, and when he became manager of the Yankees, Sr. was traded away. A couple years later, Sr. was playing for the Reds, who hired Pinella to be his manager, again. And under Pinella's watch, Sr. was traded away, again. Regardless, Sr. always liked Pinella, and so did Junior. No one in recent memory can throw a more theatrical temper tantrum than Lou. He'll deliver his magnum opus in Cleveland a few years from now, in which he enters a sort of fugue state and doesn't even remember everything he said or did. After arguing a call and getting thrown out of the game, he indignantly throws his hat into the infield. He spends another moment in the umpire's face, then spins around and kicks his hat. He kicks again, more angrily this time, and just about misses his hat entirely. Lou switches course after this, punting the hat into shallow center and jawing with the ump some more. He stomps over, bends down, and flips the hat back in the infield, and squares up for a kick this time, punting it further. Five kicks, six kicks, seven, until he navigates back into the dirt. Finally, he picks up his cap and makes his exit, but not before he throws it into the crowd with one final flourish. A helpful Cleveland fan throws it back at him, which Lou seemed to appreciate after the game. Point being, Lou Pinella is the appropriate man to lead this team. The Mariners start the season 14 and 12. The evening of May 26th, the Orioles' Kevin Bass smacks one deep into right center. It's the seventh inning of a regular season baseball game in May. Griffey doesn't have to do what he's about to do, but Ken Griffey Jr. can only be great. He has no other choice. He sprints about 20 miles, takes off, throws himself at the wall, makes one of the most iconic catches of the 1990s, and hits the ground 10 feet away from his hat. It's estimated that the Mariners, 
who haven't done much of anything in six seasons with their superstar, will be without him for three months. Meanwhile, the Mariners and the California Angels are fighting for the division lead. While the Mariners spend June trading wins and losses at an even rate, the Angels are positioning themselves for a run, which they finally begin in mid-July. In this span, they go a remarkable 17-3, and, and even those three losses were squeakers. One was a one-run loss, one an extra innings loss, and one a walk-off. Those 17 wins? More than half came by at least five runs. The Angels are clobbering the American League. In fact, up to this point in the season, they have far and away the best run differential in all of baseball. The Mariners all the way down here at plus three, almost the definition of mediocre. Throughout the Angels' streak, they've gone nowhere and are now 13 games out of the lead. Time is running out. Griffey actually returns to the field a few games ahead of schedule, but nothing much changes. California is holding steady as a rock at about 25 games over 500, and Seattle is just lying there like a beached whale. This is all they'd ever done. Even now, with the public vote less than a month away and the people of Seattle to impress, the Mariners had failed to present any other version of themselves. It seemed as though they had no other version of themselves. Across their entire 19-year history, they've experienced one day at 10 games over 500. Approximately 24 hours in August of 1991. That's it. Suppose they somehow rally in this very short window and get there again. Great. They're less than halfway there. This is a team with no meaningful past to speak of, and in all likelihood, no future. There is only the present. There is nothing to do but march. Whoa. Something terrible has happened to the California Angels. They're getting ejected. They're fighting with each other. In general, they're starting to lose it. And it's easy to understand why. Losing nine games in a row while holding the division lead is horrifying enough. But this one is like no other. Over these nine games, they've been outscored by 48 runs or just over five per game, they've gotten absolutely thumped. Now, it's true that up to this point, there have been 36 nine-game streaks in baseball history that were this bad, but look at who they happened to. Almost all of these teams were way under 500. They were already totally cooked by the time the losing streak began. And in fact, a good number of these streaks belonged to some of the worst teams in the history of the game. The only team anywhere near the 95 Angels is the 1957 Red Legs, who were 61 and 49, but they were in fourth place and a postseason appearance was pretty unlikely for them. These Angels were in first place by a huge margin. They were cruising. In what feels at first like too little too late, the Mariners finally smell blood in the water. When they wake up on the morning of September 19th, they're suddenly only two games behind. It's their big day. That evening, they rally from a 4-1 deficit to take the Rangers into extra innings. In the bottom of the 11th, Griffey finds himself down to his final strike. What's important to know about Junior is that he's far more than just a power hitter. Most pitches aren't home run opportunities, but many including some well outside the strike zone, our chance to slap one through. And with a man on second, that is all the Mariners need. Here it comes, and it swung on and lined off the glove of the third baseman Ortiz. Here comes straight, the Mariners win it! Down south, the Angels lose again. Then, they watch the news and wait. With most of the ballots counted, the measure to fund a new Mariner stadium, thereby keeping them in Seattle, currently leads by a thin margin. But these are just the voters who showed up today. Around 45,000 absentee ballots are still out there, and they were cast some time ago by voters who hadn't yet seen the lunacy that's currently unfolding. These voters have been watching these Mariners, the Miracle Mariners. But the votes yet to be counted are from people who know nothing but 
these mariners. The counting continues. The next day, it's announced that with close to half a million votes counted, the lead has shrunk to 300. There are still 15,000 votes yet to be counted. That night, the Mariners come from behind again to knock off the A's 10 to 7. Down in Texas, the Angels answer with another loss. This happens again and again. The Seattle Mariners are now leading the American League West. If they hold on, they're headed to the playoffs for the first time in their history. It all happened so quickly, it's disorienting. The Angels cheated fate by dropping nine in a row down the home stretch and keeping a comfortable lead, but then, after briefly gathering themselves, they dropped nine in a row again. Losing streaks of this size are extraordinarily rare in baseball. Since the Angels were founded 35 years ago, they've only suffered a handful, and typically during seasons in which they were way out of the playoff race and didn't have much to play for, now at the worst possible time, They've suffered two in the space of a month. No new results from King County votes since the 21st. It's time to meet two more heroes. First, Tino Martinez, just another of the Mariners' seemingly endless supply of power hitters. His career will be defined by memorable clutch home runs, although many of them come after he leaves Seattle. And then, there's Dave Niehaus. I have zero emotional investment in the Mariners, but the way their longtime broadcaster Dave Niehaus would call big moments still made my goosebumps get goosebumps. And whether it was his trademark phrases like breaking out the rye bread and mustard for a grand salami, or just his overall infectious enthusiasm that made a random Tuesday night in August feel like Game 7 of the World Series, he simply had a unique way to connect with fans and bring the game to life. Tragically, Niehaus was taken from us far too soon, shortly following the 2010 season, leaving a void that's truly impossible to fill. For so long, through years and years of misery, the one thing Mariner fans could take solace in was knowing they'd be treated to Niehaus's pure brilliance for three hours, night after night, starting with their first pitch in 1977 and continuing for 34 years and nearly 5,300 games thereafter. It's a wild back and forth game between the Mariners and Athletics. Down by a run in the bottom of the ninth, Tino Martinez steps in with a man on first. Listen closely here as Dave Niehaus's voice momentarily fades out before returning closer to the mic. Here comes the pitch to Tino, swung on and belted deep to right field! He was probably spinning in his chair. I asked in part one why anyone would want to watch the Mariners in those atrocious early days. Well, there's your reason. Regardless of the quality, or lack thereof, of the product put forth on the field, Niehaus always, always, always provided an A++ broadcast. Bad news comes on the 26th. The measure has, for the time being, lost the lead but it's still alive. There are still about 3,000 ballots yet to be counted. After weeks of sniping at one another from different parts of the country, the Angels finally have to drag their sorry asses up to Seattle and meet their conquerors in person. They get thumped 10 to two, thanks to homers from Griffey and Jay Buhner. It's their seventh consecutive win, and the Mariners now lead the West by three games with just six to play. The next day, it becomes clear. The vote has failed. The Mariners lose to the Angels that afternoon, win their next two games against the Rangers, and end up splitting the series in Texas after getting thumped 9-2 and 9-3. They left exactly enough room for the Angels to catch up to them, and the Angels did. Their 144-game schedule ends in a tie. It necessitates something Major League Baseball hasn't seen in 15 years, a special one-game tiebreaker between the Mariners and Angels to decide who goes to the playoffs. What comes next for the Mariners and where they end up playing next year, no one can really say. But if nothing else, 
This much is guaranteed. The Seattle Mariners will play one more baseball game. The final game of an absurd season will turn out to be its most absurd. For one, the timing is odd. This is without question the most important game the Mariners have ever played, and yet the first pitch is at 1 p.m. on a Monday afternoon. Well, at least it was the biggest story of that Monday afternoon, right? No, it wasn't. It's time to meet Randy Johnson. Who, at 6 foot 10, became the tallest player in the history of Major League Baseball when he entered the bigs in 1988. Everyone thought he had greatness in him. It showed up in flashes, most notably in 1990, when he threw the first no-hitter in Mariners history. But he led the league in walks three years in a row, and his ERA hung around four, placing him around the middle of the pack. And then, Nolan Ryan came to town. Before a Mariners-Rangers game in 1992, Johnson ran into the future Hall of Famer and confessed that something in his mechanics wasn't working. Ryan said, hey, try landing on the front of your foot instead of your heel. Randy listened. And just like that, his numbers drastically improved, and he was well on his way to becoming one of the most accomplished pitchers baseball has ever seen. He was also among the most intimidating. He had a 102 mile per hour fastball, but his most devastating pitch was a 90 mile per hour slider that had so much on it that it looked like a fastball. It was almost unfair. It was called Mr. Snappy. So with the future of the organization hanging in the balance, Seattle skipper Lou Pinella had the ultimate ace up his sleeve as he was able to give the ball to Johnson on short rest. And it's completely clear why that seemingly risky move wasn't so risky, but was in fact the obvious call. The big unit wasn't just the team's top pitcher, but he was the very best in the entire American League by miles. In terms of both OPS allowed and ERA, no one was close to him. He notched at least 12 strikeouts in nine games, existing on his own stratosphere relative to the rest of the league on his way to fanning nearly 300 batters despite an abbreviated MLB season. So while Seattle had the runaway Cy Young winner on the hill, the Angels ace was out of commish, with all-star Chuck Finley having tossed over 100 pitches the prior afternoon to get him to this game. That meant the Angels' hopes rested on longtime Mariner Mark Langston, who Seattle had traded to Montreal in the deal that landed him Johnson. The Mariners were oozing confidence in a game that they got to host based on the flip of a coin. Pinella saw a win as a foregone conclusion. So did left fielder Vince Coleman. And Randy was indeed an untouchable force of nature for the first six innings of this one, retiring each of the Angels' first 17 batters before his bid for perfection was broken up by his ex-roommate of all people. Langston was pretty good too, allowing just one run through six. But then, things got away from him in the seventh. The Mariners loaded up the bases with former Angel Luis Soho at the dish, who then punched a grounder to the right that probably should have been an ending-ending 3-1 putout, but that instead, first baseman JT Snow flubbed. Snow could only watch as the ball blooped into foul territory and underneath the Angels' bullpen bench. By the time right fielder Tim Salmon dug it up, two Mariners had scored. An unfortunate set of circumstances turned disastrous when Langston's throwing error allowed for the ultimate embarrassment. Four runs scoring on a ball that touched an infielder's glove for what has to be the first and only time in the history of organized baseball. Thanks to the fielding work of two angels that would each win gold gloves that season. That is baseball for you. With the game now blown wide open, the M's could just sit back and ride Johnson to the AL West title. Well, now the Seattle Mariners are guaranteed to exist for at least a few more days as they move on to make their first ever playoff appearance in the 1995 ALDS. And if this were a work of fiction, this is exactly the way we would write it. <laughs>